very pleased to have with us for the Dave Leonard and his wife Nikki and two of their children. As our summer series continues, Brother Leonard's lesson will be on Melchizedek and Christ as we continue our study about types and shadows of the Old Testament to the New. Brother Dave is the minister at the West Georgia Congregation. He's been and spoken to us several times. We're glad to have him again here tonight. So we're looking forward to his lesson, Brother Leonard. watching Brother Stevenson go back and forth up here a moment ago and made me think of a one-man show. When Nikki and I first married, we moved to Wyoming and we're doing mission work out there and there was one other couple who were members of the congregation where we were and there were a few Sundays when he was, he was an older man, a few times when he was sick and wasn't able to be there and, and I had to do lead in, in every aspect of the worship and you get to feeling that way after a little while. This is uh, quite taxing and and uh, it's hard to switch gears sometimes to go from one thing to another. But uh, certainly we always appreciate everyone who, who does lead and take part. And I know y'all are at a, a little bit of a loss this week with all the people being gone to camp. So, uh, but we persevere. We go right through. This is a, an outstanding theme for not only a summer series, but any time of Bible study. The shadows of good things to come. The ideas of the things of the old drawing pictures for us that when we finally see them in the New Testament, we get to see a more full picture, have a greater understanding and appreciation for what God has brought to us. I've looked through the list of, of not only the speakers, but the topics that you have lined up for the whole summer, and I wish I could be here every Wednesday night to, fo to follow along with this. And uh, it, it's a, an outstanding method of study to look for types and antitypes. And Melchizedek and Christ being a part of this kind of picture is a little bit distinct from some of the others. There are many types that we see and antitypes that we, we pair together just because we see the similarities. But there are not very many of them that the Bible just comes right out and says, these two are similar and I want you to compare them. I want you to look at them. I want you to see how they are alike and in this instance, how they differ from something else that's so significant in the scriptures. If you mention priesthood, probably 90% of us immediately would think about Aaron and the tribe of Levi, the, the sons of Aaron, the ones who started not only with him being the first high priest, but continued for many generations under the law of Moses. We read about the promise, of course, that was given to Abraham and then the seed line that came from that promise, from God fulfilling his word. And finally, the Hebrews, the, the Jewish nation, and through this, the Levitical priesthood and the prominence that they have throughout the Old Testament. We sang a song just a moment ago that deals so strongly with this idea that we're going to be talking about, and at least next to, quite a bit this evening, and that is... Where could I go? Where could I go? In the book of Leviticus, a picture is painted of the, the priesthood standing between God and men. And when men are in sin, they do not, in and of themselves, have a way of approaching the holy God. The priesthood was the answer to this, not because they were better than the others, they too were men who were flawed, who had sins, who had transgressions that stood between them and God. The priesthood was the answer in the sense that they were the ones chosen or selected to make the sacrifices. It was the blood. Leviticus lays all of that out very plainly about how critical the offerings, the sacrifices were, and how that life is in the blood. And so the blood offerings... But the Levitical priesthood, Aaron as a high priest, were not the first priests of the Bible. They were not the only priests of the Bible. And so tonight we're going to be looking at a picture, a type and antitype of Melchizedek and Christ. Seven times in scripture the phrase is found after the order of Melchizedek. 
Now, it's mentioned almost every time in the book of Hebrews, but not every time. There's one mention of this back in the 110th Psalm, verses 1 through 4. David would write some words about this, some prophetic words, speaking about the one who would be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. When the book of Hebrews comes, chapter 5, verses 6 and 10, chapter 6, verse 20, chapter 7, verses 11, 17, and 20, all have this same phrase contained in them. And every time, without doubt, without any speculation or question whatsoever, it is applied specifically to Jesus the Christ. It's never applied or even possibly given to anyone else. A high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek was a priest. A priest of the Most High God. A priest of the Most High God and the King of Salem is the description that we read about him back in Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20. The priest of the Most High God and the King of Salem. As we start looking to the relationship tonight, the type and a type relationship between Melchizedek and Christ, I want us to see, first of all, that the initial picture of this relationship is found by looking at Melchizedek. It's found by looking at the man who is pictured to be the type, the one who is foreshadowing the much greater who would come after him. The picture of this relationship is found in Genesis 14. If you would turn there for just a few moments with me. A few key phrases and words here that we need to see and and follow. In chapter 14, beginning in verse 18, it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, professor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now in this description, we see uh, what this picture is going to begin laying out for us. First of all, we need to note that the picture that's given here of Melchizedek is a picture of eminence. A picture of one who is great. One who is in a high position. Not only by the titles that it gives. We see these, first of all, it says he's the king of Salem. Now, the king of Salem literally means the king of peace. But it also says he's the the priest of the Most High God. But his name, Melchizedek, if you look up his name and see what it means in Hebrews 7, gives us a definition of what his name means. His name means that he is the king of righteousness. Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace, priest of the Most High God. You know, there are not very many people in Scripture who have these kinds of things said about them. There are a number of people who wear the title king. There are not many people at all who wear the title king of righteousness, king of peace. These are great and notable accolades given to Melchizedek. And then on top of that, to be called the priest of the Most High God. A wondrous statement that should allow us to see, you know, there were many kings in the Old Testament. How many of them also served as a priest in any capacity? Whether it was before, like Melchizedek, during the time of the law, it was not possible. During the time of the law of Moses for someone to be a king and be a priest, Isaiah thought that that might be possible. In 2 Chronicles 26, you remember reading about Isaiah, the king who decided he was going to burn incense before God in the capacity of a priest, and he was stricken with leprosy. The kings came from another tribe. The kings, we know, of course, following down to the line of Jesus, came from Judah. Not every king, obviously, But that was the kingly line. That was the the line when you talked about, you were thinking of royalty. You were thinking of ones who reign. When you thought about priests, it was always and only Levi. And within Levi, much more narrow, of the lineage of Aaron. We don't see this relationship of king and priest overlapping very often. And with Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, who's also called the king of peace, 
we see some great descriptions here of this man and a picture of who Christ is going to be. Do you know when you look at the Bible and you find the idea of peace that comes from God, divine peace, the peace that passes understanding, the peace that should secure our hearts, the peace that should rule our lives? Lots of phrases in the New Testament about the peace that God offers. And every time it is it is always, I say every time, and I know that's a redundancy, making a point. It is always tied to righteousness. There is no peace of God without the righteousness that God prescribes. God doesn't offer the kind of peace that he offers through the new covenant to just everybody in the world. It's offered to those who are of the covenant, to those who are in Christ. Melchizedek is such a great picture of who the Christ is going to be when he comes into the world because he is the king of righteousness, because he is the king of peace, and because he is the priest of the Most High God. We see a great picture here in the eminence, the, the idea of how high and lofty Melchizedek is held up before us, but not only is he shown as one who is, is eminent, he's also shown as one who is eternal. Follow that picture from Genesis 14 into Psalm 110 and later into Hebrews 7. All three of the passages that, that deal with Melchizedek in Scripture and in Psalm 110 and in Hebrews 5, 6, and 7, you're reading about Christ being after the order of Melchizedek, but it says something very particular about him, that he's eternal. No, not eternal like Christ is. Not eternal like Jesus is. He's eternal in concept, not in literality, not in reality. He is not a, a living being still on earth today. He is a spiritual being. He's not still living here He's not still in this life, in this world, serving as a priest of the Most High God. We know that for certain because there's only one high priest of God. There's only one who can stand in that capacity under the new covenant. So we know when it says that he has no beginning, no end, no father, no mother, it does not mean that he just sprang out of the air one day. It does not mean that he just one day popped out of the ground and there was a priest of God and now he's here forever. It's a picture in words. And the picture, the type that it's giving us, showing that he is made like the Son of God, Hebrews 7, 1 through 3 tells us, the picture of his eternality and the likeness of it in Christ is that he had no beginning and no end, no father, no mother, according to his priesthood not according to his physical existence. He was a physical human being, which means he had to be born. He lived, and according to every other physical human being, with the exception of, of a couple that God took, he had to die. And so we're not talking about an eternal physical man. We're talking about an eternal spiritual relationship and spiritual priesthood. This man who had no beginning, look at what time this was recorded. What man would have been writing the words of Genesis 14? Moses. The same man that penned the rest of the book of Genesis. And you don't go far at all in the book of Genesis before you begin reading genealogies. Extensive lists of who begot who and who was the father, who was the offspring. How did this line trace? whether it was the line of God's people, the line of some of the other peoples that came out of them and left them. We read some extensive genealogies. And when it came to Abraham and the promise regarding his seed, the idea of genealogies became obsessive because it had to. God promised that Abraham, through his seed, was going to bring someone into this world who would bless all the nations. Now, what point would there be to making that promise if you could not trace the genealogical seed from Abraham all the way to Christ? When you get to Matthew chapter 1, what do you read? We're about to read about the, the birth and the life and the death, the resurrection of Christ. And so before you start into all of that, it begins... The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. 
It takes us all the way back immediately in one, one short reading. The generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, as was promised, the son of Abraham, as was promised. And then he starts tracing the generations, taking us all the way back to where the promise was given. We're reading about, about a, a wonderful plan of God and a wonderful man of God. Melchizedek is not eternal, but his priesthood had no genealogical references. Nobody to look back to to say, I'm a priest because my father was a priest. I'm a priest because his father was one, and his father and his father. That was the typical order of things. That's what they saw under Judaism. That's what they saw with the Levitical priesthood, the, the line of Aaron. I'm a priest today because my father was, his father was, his father was, all the way back to Aaron. Melchizedek did not have any genealogy. But not only did he not have anything preceding him, he didn't have anyone following him, no descendants either. That, does that mean he did not marry and have any children? That's not what it's saying. He had no descendants in his priesthood. The priests under the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, would serve for a time. Then when they either stepped out of that service or died, someone else took their place. The high priest was only a high priest for a certain period of time. He couldn't be the high priest after he died. So at the latest, when he was dead, he was finished. And someone else was appointed to take his place. That was not the case with Melchizedek. There was no one coming after him in his line. His priesthood had no genealogy beginning and it had no descendants following. It was without beginning and it was without end. Not only this, but it makes such a strong point of this that in this genealogically focused time, it says there's no record of his birth or his death. There's no way to trace this man anywhere. He just is. And as he is, he is the king of righteousness. He is the king of peace. And he is the priest of the most high God. What a picture to be painted to set the stage for this relationship, this type and antitype. But not only do we have a picture that we can draw from in this. We also have a prophecy, and we mentioned just a few moments ago the 110th Psalm. Turn there, if you would, for just a moment. In the 110th Psalm, we see this relationship prophesied. It's pictured in the man, Melchizedek. And it is prophesied by David, I, which I find very, very interesting because not only is Melchizedek a king and a priest, and he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, but David is the one who prophesies, who, who by the, of course, by the inspiration of God, gives this prophecy regarding the coming high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he's going to be the king from the lineage of David. So the one who is his type in priesthood is written about by the one who is his ancestor in his kingly role in being the, the king that God said he would be over his kingdom of the lineage of David. So the king, who is his father, is writing about the priest, who is his type. And in the 110th Psalm, we read these words, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. After we look at this, we see that this psalm, this, this prophecy, gives us some great things to note. First of all, he talks about an office that's going to be filled an office that is going to be filled or be occupied. In this office, he says, he says, you're going to reign. You're going to be a king. Notice what he said there about the end, making the enemies your footstool while you sit at my right hand. And he talks about the rod of your strength coming out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. He's talking about someone reigning, 
Someone having the power, the authority of being a king. So first of all, in this prophecy, he's laying out that this person is going to have the power of rule. He's going to be the king. But secondly, he lays out that he's going to have a great, a great and notable priesthood. A priesthood that is unlike the priesthood that is in power for the Jews at this time. David is a Jew. David is the king of God's people. And as a Jew, reigning as a king, he, like everyone else, would have the moments where he would turn to the priesthood at the temple, would bring the sacrifices necessary for the cleansing of his sins so that he could have the atonement that God offered, so that he could be counted as righteous and look forward to the coming sacrifice of his offspring, of Jesus. When we read about David's prophecy here, he's prophesying about someone who's going to be more powerful than he is as a king. And someone who, not like he, who has to turn to the priests to bring his sacrifice so that he can turn to God. Where could I go? David had to say, I can go to the priests at the temple with my sacrifice and I can find atonement by following God's commands. But he's writing about someone who's not going to have to follow that vein. Someone who's not going to turn to a priesthood, but who's going to be a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So in this prophecy, we read some great things about this office. But secondly, not only does he lay out that this person's going to be a king and is going to be a priest, but he also says, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. Some translations have there, will not repent. He will not let go. He will not change. Not only does this prophecy speak about an office, it speaks from an oath. The Lord has sworn this, and he will not change. He will not deter from this. He will not be swayed from this. There's nothing that could convince him. There's nothing that by power could force him. He has sworn this and there is no changing this. Nothing whatsoever. That you are going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The prophecy speaks of, of this great office of king and priest. And it does so by an oath of God. There is no changing there is nothing that can take this away. Melchizedek already was. He was in the history book at this time. He had been written about. His life was already passed by the time David writes this. He already was the king of righteousness, the king of peace, the priest of the most high God. And now in this prophetic statement, to be after the order of Melchizedek, to serve as a king and rule, to serve as, as the high priest of God, now we're starting to see this picture in prophecy as it's pointing toward its perfection. When you read in your Bible the word perfect, oftentimes you're dealing with the idea of complete, mature, something that's reached its goal or its end. Not perfect as in sinless or spotless. Most of the time it's dealing with something reaching full maturity, something reaching its goal. And that's what we're dealing with tonight, the, the idea of the picture of Melchizedek, the prophecy that says you're going to be like him. He's the type, you're going to be the antitype. And then we see it perfected in Christ. Hebrews chapter 7. In chapter 5, the statement is made briefly. In chapter 6, it is reiterated again, quite briefly. In chapter 7... The Hebrews writer digs in and writes more extensively about the priesthood of Jesus than any other writer in the New Testament. He writes about the priesthood of Christ from a perspective of showing us how great it really is. You know, when you start in Hebrews 1, the immediate picture that comes is there is one who speaks to us today. 
God has spoken to every generation of man, and he's done so in many different ways by many different messengers. But in these last days, he has spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. He, he starts off immediately setting before us the idea that there is no one that we can turn to, no one better for us, no one who can, who can meet our needs other than Christ. And one of the ways that he does this, because these Christians who are Jewish in their physical lineage are having obvious difficulties with wanting to turn back to some of the tenets of Judaism, by chapter 10 and chapter 11, he's telling them, we're not of those who turn back unto perdition. We're of those who move forward with our faith, who obey to the saving of the soul. And then chapter 11, he says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith, look at what these people did. Because they had the right understanding, the right mindset, the right approach to God. They had faith. Faith, which comes by hearing the word of God. Faith, which comes by knowledge, which comes by evidence, which comes by us knowing, not guessing, not wondering, not doubting, not, I really wish this was the case, but understanding and knowledge and trust based on evidence. Now, this is what the Hebrews writer is writing about. Keep your eyes, keep your mind, keep your heart set on Christ. Because if you turn back, you're only turning to things and people who are lesser. Who are not as great as Christ in any way. He's the greater spokesman. He's the greater lawgiver. He's the greater priest. He is the sacrifice. Greater than that of animals that could never forgive sins. He is the greater in every respect. And so as the Hebrews writer is drawing this great picture, this picture of the supremacy of Christ in every area, he says, understand who this man is compared to Aaron. Aaron was a good man. Aaron was not flawless. You know, Aaron, as, as the one who was going to be appointed high priest and stand before the children of Israel once each year, fulfilling his special duty of going into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the offering to sprinkle on and around the mercy seat so that he and the people could have atonement for their sins, so that they could have relationship with, with God, their creator, their father, this man is the one, you'll remember, who when Moses went up into Sinai and stayed up there for several weeks, when the children of Israel cried out and said, he's dead, he's not coming back. We don't have a leader anymore. They turn to Aaron and they say, you lead us. And the way we want you to lead us is, you make us a golden calf. So we can worship and do the things that we did in Egypt. And you remember what Aaron did on this occasion. What a great contrast between these brothers. Aaron said, bring me all your gold. Bring me your jewelry. Bring me everything gold that you have. And he cast it into the fire and when it melted, it says he removed it and fashioned it. He fashioned it. Not a mistake. Not, it didn't just happen. That's what he says to Moses later. Well, we threw the gold in the fire and it, this golden calf just came out. No, it didn't. He took the melted gold and he fashioned a golden calf. And when Moses was told by God that things were going on that shouldn't be, when he started down the mount, when he met Joshua, when they got to the point that they could hear, they heard, they heard the craziness that was going on in the camp of Israel. And when they got where they could see, they were seeing the people naked and dancing and bowing and worshiping this golden calf while God was in the mountain right before them. Aaron 
tried to make excuse, Moses stood up not only to Aaron but to all the people. He called them on their sin. He withstood them like Paul did to Peter, withstood them to the face. And when God called down the judgment, he told the Levites to draw the swords to go in among their brethren and kill everyone who would not repent. 3,000 people. 3,000 of the children of Israel died because they chose to hold on to a calf that their first high priest made for them. You want to know why Christ is far greater than the Levitical priesthood? Because he's not like them. He is not a man in sin. He is not one of the people who is just as wrong as the people who has to offer first for himself and then for the people. He could take his blood into the Holy of Holies, heaven, and he could make offering at the very throne of God as a high priest because he was flawless because he had no transgression. He had committed no sin. There was no guile in his mouth, Peter would write about him. Over and over again, the scriptures portray for us the supremacy of Christ. Read the book of Colossians, especially chapters 1 and 2, and focus on the supremacy of Jesus and his sufficiency. Because he is supreme, we don't need anyone or anything else. When we look at the king of righteousness, the king of peace, the priest of the Most High God from Genesis 14, Melchizedek, we read the prophecy of David, the picture that Melchizedek gives us, the prophecy that David speaks concerning the priesthood of Christ and his reigning as king. Zechariah also, chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, would talk about the branch who would be raised up, who would sit and rule upon his throne and would be a priest upon his throne. Going to be a king and priest at the same time. We see so many things that are said about this. So, many, so much of this picture is being brought forward. And now we see the completion of it, the perfection of it, as we look at Jesus. Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, or paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest, who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. 
By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. As we read these great words, these great descriptions of Christ as a high priest, then we see the completion of the picture that Melchizedek began so many generations before. Not generations as in genealogy, but many, many lives of men. The king of peace, the king of righteousness, the priest of the Most High God, whose antitype we see before us today. The king that reigns over his kingdom, the church, his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all, Ephesians 1, 22 and 3. The high priest, Hebrews 8, 1, who serves now at the right hand of God as a king on a throne, as a high priest with an offering already having been made, who now intercedes for us, who pleads for us, who is, as John would write, 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, he says, we have a propitiation. We have someone who sacrificed himself for us so that we do not have to carry our sins through death and into condemnation. The antitype is greater than the type. He brings to us eternal life. We have such a great hope. We have such a great message because we have Christ, the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Thank you so much for your time tonight.
Just a few announcements before Brother Dave comes back and extends the invitation. For those that were in the auditorium, wasn't that an excellent lesson? Very well pre prepared and very well delivered and hopefully well received. So we're thankful for his lesson. He'll come back in just a moment and extend the invitation. I got a call from Brother Jim Waldron earlier today, and he wished to make sure that the brethren here knew that he was very thankful for the money that we sent. You remember the uh, plea that we made on behalf of the uh, young sister in Christ that was beaten to death by her Hindu husband had the two children that were orphaned. Come to find out, uh, Brother Waldron has a very good friend that is not only a medical doctor and a surgeon, but he also went to Bear Valley Colorado School of Preaching and also is a graduate, I think, of Fried Hardeman with a master's and a bachelor degree. Very solid in the faith, very sharp young man in his early 30s. He is in the process of looking after a children's home. The two young children that we helped, plus three others that were orphaned, their parents were killed in an automobile accident, that were being raised Muslim at the time. The two children that we helped, plus these other three, are all going to this children's home, and our money is helping them get there and the supplies that go along with that. So again, Brother Waldron wanted to make sure that we knew that and was very thankful for the uh, help that we provided to that effort. Other activities, uh, Brothers Keepers Group 3, Bob and Lisa's group, will meet this coming Sunday after the evening service, ice cream supper, fellowship hall, sign-up list in the foyer. Group 1, Jake and Julie's group, will meet at the home of the Adams. That will be Saturday week, June 28, 6 p.m. Sign-up list in the foyer. Group 4, Mike and Cindy's group, reschedule their meeting for Saturday week also, June 28, 5.30, lower parking lot. Sign-up list in the foyer. Also, for those men that have agreed, hopefully you'll remember, this Saturday morning we're going to help clean up at camp. So if you have the availability to be at camp no later than 9 o'clock to kind of help them spruce it up for the next group that's coming in, that would be greatly appreciated. Rain or shine, Saturday morning no later than 9 o'clock at the camp. Bring some rakes, bring some weed eaters, bring some blowers, brooms, and that kind of thing so that we can help spruce up the camp for the next group that's coming in. Other activities, there's a one-day vacation Bible school at the Waco Congregation that will be June 21, what is that, this Saturday, beginning at 10 o'clock. Also, there is a homecoming event upcoming this coming Sunday at the West Georgia Congregation. Uh, service time's 10 o'clock, 11 a.m. for morning worship, and the evening worship will begin at 2 p.m. fellowship meal after the morning worship service and also a vacation Bible school upcoming. That'll be uh, Monday through Friday, June the 23rd through the 27th, and their uh, evenings, right? Beginning at 6.30 until about 8 o'clock, Bible character, a Bible character which is Joseph will be the subject. But again, vacation Bible school at West Georgia beginning this coming Monday. Is that right? June the 23rd. Okay, Brother Dave. In the auditorium tonight, we were talking about, in case you weren't in here, about Melchizedek and Christ. And some of the pictures that we were noting tonight were of the different priesthoods, Melchizedek's and Christ, of course, being the antitype of it, as, as compared to the Levitical priesthood. And when you start backing up and looking through Scripture at all of these different ones who served as priests, we read about Melchizedek, we read about Jethro, who was Moses' father-in-law, we read about Aaron and his lineage under the old law, and then we read about Christ. As we're looking at this, you can't help but be impressed with the amount of blood. I wonder how much blood there would be. If we could go all the way back to those, those two animals, or however many animals were shed, that shed their blood, when Adam and Eve were clothed with animal skins in the garden, and then follow the sacrifices of Abel and those throughout the patriarchal period, coming all the way to Aaron and the priesthood of Levi. I wonder how much blood we'd have. I wonder how many, how many tanker trucks we could fill up. How many train cars 
How long would that train be if we could, could capture all of that blood and keep it around? And then recognize, according to Hebrews 10, as we're looking at the great differences there between Christ and Aaron, that all of that blood combined could not forgive one sin. The Hebrews writer puts it in these words, it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. But the blood of Christ is powerful to forgive. And unlike the blood that was shed under the, the law of Moses, which was available largely just to the Israelites, we read that the blood of Christ is available to everyone. The power to forgive available to every person. The opportunity for forgiveness. Why would anyone who is informed through scripture to know of sin, to know of salvation, to understand what God has done on our behalf? Why would anyone choose to carry their sins? Jesus would extend an invitation while he was here on earth that's worded like this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. You're carrying a burden that first of all, you don't have to carry. And secondly, you can't carry to a good end. There is forgiveness. There is the opportunity to have that burden lifted through his blood. Tonight, if you would have that forgiveness, if you are not a child of God, you can come through the commands of the gospel of Christ, to the blood of Christ, and you can receive that forgiveness. In Romans 6, Paul worded it this way. He said, Know ye not that so many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We have that opportunity. If we as children of God have turned aside, if we have walked away from our faith, walked away from the blood of Christ, we can come back. The picture of the prodigal son shows us of a, a father who loves, whose desire is for us to come home, who wants us to be saved. He wants us to be forgiven. He does not want to lose his children. If you are a child of God tonight and you've left home, then you have a father who wants you back. And the blood of Christ is still powerful and available. If you have a need, won't you come as we stand and sing this song? There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us taste no grace to his free. There's a fountain of love from the source
thankful for each of his presence this evening, especially those who came our way as a visitor tonight. We invite you back at your next opportunity to be with us Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study. If there's nothing else, we'll sing a verse of number 290, 290, and be dismissed in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day that you've blessed us with, especially, Father, the blessings that enable us to assemble here tonight to study another portion of thy word. Father, we're so thankful for the simplicity of the gospel, that we may read it, we may hear it, and we may understand it. We pray, Father, we're prepared to share it with those around about us. Father, we're thankful for Dave and the effort he put forth to teach us tonight. We pray that you would continue to be with him. Father, we pray for our campers, that you would be with them this week, that they may learn much and they may have safety. Father, continue with us through this night and whatever future life you see fit for us. For this we ask in Christ's name, amen.